Good morning and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Sally Quinn, a contributing columnist here at the Washington Post, and I'm delighted to be joined by Carl Speraza Anthony to talk about his new book out today, Camera Girl. But Carl, welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank you so much, Sally. Um, uh, today's pub date, and this is the first event, and I can't think of a more auspicious beginning, so I really appreciate it. Well, this is a special book for me because I, um, my husband was a very close friend of the Kennedys, Jack and Jackie, and his former wife. And so I know a lot about the Kennedys um, and about Jackie. I thought I did until I read your book, which uh, I was riveted by because you have written about Jack or Jackie Kennedy that I never knew anything about. And I never, it was just blew me away to find out who she really was. And one of the things that I was curious about was how you felt about her once you finished doing the research and writing the book. Did you have a totally different view of her before you started and then once you finished? First of all, that's a really excellent question to ask a biographer. So thank you for that. Um, you know, I had written uh, and it was published in 1997, an oral history biography of her called As We Remember Her, in which I uh, interviewed uh, so many people, including um, Teddy Kennedy, Eunice Shriver, um, her stepbrother, Yusha, I spent a weekend with in uh, Newport. And um, so I had a very palpable sense of her as a person, but that, and, and so many of those interviews, most of those interviews, I mean, that manuscript was insane. It was it was like 5,000 pages, the first draft. Um, but luckily I saved it. Um, and so I had I had to retype it uh, because it was just on paper, but I had so much material that went unused. But it was really in going through those columns, which I do think is the heart of this story, her her daily columns. And you you're getting you're getting a really close snapshot of her six days a week for a year and a half. And I did get a, a very different sense of her, a very earthy sense and, and that wicked sense of humor. I mean, you know, uh, people like to uh, so-called uh, call it sometimes Irish wit. And but the truth is, she was actually more Irish than she was French. And, you know, I, I sometimes think that that wit, that biting wit is was another reason she and Jack Kennedy bonded so much. But I really did, and I, I appreciate that question because that's exactly what my hope is, is that people do get a fuller sense of her. Uh, along those lines, one last thing, I think slowing her story down. I think she's got such a rich story that even when I wrote the oral history biography of her, it was such a sweep you know, of her entire life that to slow it down to these four formative years, that that was a, a very a crucial decision my editor and I made early on. Well, I, you know, what, what was fascinating to me, and I really never had this sense of how smart she was. And I mean, you just laid it all out. And I, I, I was just stunned 
at, I mean, and there were one of the teachers, one of her teachers said that in 35 years of teaching, she was the most brilliant student she'd ever had. And, and you write about how out of 26,000 exams, 22 and 1.10 of 1%, Jackie was one of those 22. Uh, yeah. I just didn't, and you know, of course, growing up, my view of her was that she was this iconic person. You know, you get the tour of the Blue Room and the White House and the clothes and the, you know, I'm here with the Jackie Kennedy, as, as he said in Paris, her husband. But I, I just didn't, and even when she later on, after he died, ended up being a book editor, I thought, really? She's a book editor? I mean, I just had no idea of, of the kind of how well educated and, and uh, how smart she was. Um, and I just wondered if that had struck you too, because I don't think that if you asked most people what Jackie Kennedy was like or what, who she was, they would say she was brilliant, which she clearly was. I, I have to say, I, I always had a sense of that. I had some, I met her twice when I was in high school and um, I wrote, started writing to her early and I, um, her great confidant Nancy Tuckerman came to trust me and I don't believe I've ever violated that trust in terms of what was important for the historical record and one got a sense of that because she had what is now called executive function her the way she thought um, and organized things she had a she had a way of uh, having a, a you know a, a, a really wide uh, breadth of interest but she was able to organize things. And you see the way she organized, for example, that White House restoration project. There were about six or seven very specific elements to that, which culminated, which the public never saw. And that's, I think, another element of this. You know, she was raised in a, a systemic sexist society where women were really not encouraged to let people know that they were intelligent as if it was some kind of a disease. And, you know, she just, because I think of that traumatic childhood, uh, the very bitter acrimony of between her parents uh, before, and, during and after the divorce, that she escaped and she escaped into reading and she had a rigorous mind, but that reading, she just, she just lost herself in so many different worlds, not just history, but, you know, contemporary novels as well. And um, that really inspired her imagination. And I think obviously inspired her to to become a storyteller herself. Well, as somebody asked her uh, and, and she replied, and it, you write in the book, what are you interested in? And she said, I'm interested in everything. Um, yeah. But I, I found... Um, you know, there was also a sadness there because her parents were divorced and her mother, Janet, um, really despised her father, Blackjack, because Bouvier, because he had had, had many affairs and drank too much and all of that. Um, but, but the thing that I found really sort of sad that I didn't know about was how terrible Janet was. I knew Janet. Um, and I always thought that she was a bit of a snob. And somewhat of a phony, but, but, um, I, she was used to hit Jackie and beat her and slap her across the face. I, I never knew any of that. I mean, that clearly has got to have left some scar on her that we never saw. Yeah. And, and it, that's also in the, uh, in the official record, um, uh, the testimony of, um, uh, several uh, women who worked for what was then the Bouvier household, and they left those very specific accounts of her mother, as well as um, later on, uh, you know, family members, um, uh, you know, verified that. And, um, you know, I think I think I tried to also be understanding, too, of at least of where Janet Auchincloss was coming from. You know, everything is rooted in, in something. There was horrible bigotry uh, at that time in the, in the United States and the Eastern seaboard and the, uh, what was called high society, the so social register world of, of, of the ruling elite. 
against Irish Catholics, against Catholics, yeah, against, I, you know. And, N-I-N-A, no Irish need apply. <laughs> and, and that was not that far off from Janet's own background. And, you know, her own mother uh, was born in Margaret, um, was was born in the tenements in the uh, of the Lower East Side, and Janet's grandmother Maria Merritt uh, still spoke with a brogue, and and Janet was so embarrassed about her that she told people that that was a ma- she was a maid. So, uh, and 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 I don't think it was to be mean. I think she was just striving. She was striving, you know, to be at the top. It was a very different way than Joe Kennedy of course, handled it. But I, 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 I hope at least there's some understanding of, of where Janet's coming from. Well, you know, I, um, I, I felt that Jackie, uh, one of the things that was interesting to me about her was um, I found her such an enigma. You know, and the one point, there she is as sort of a college student. She's at Vassar, which is a, you know, very fancy college. Um, and yet, um, she hates it. She she feels, and she doesn't study, and she's the smartest person in the class. But again, as you say, that girls weren't supposed to be smart in those days. They had to sort of play down their intelligence in order to catch a husband. I remember in college, it was a ring by spring for the seniors. Um, but then, you know, and then she was desperate to get away from her family and go to Paris, which she finally did her junior year abroad. Um, and then she, but she sort of came out in a way, um, socially and she was all over the place and she was going to parties and she was, uh, a very, it seemed to me very gregarious and very outgoing. She was clearly witty and clever and fun and slightly eccentric. Um, and yet she was an intellectual. I mean, the studies that she did in Paris were extraordinary. The kind of pa- the papers she wrote. And um, and yet people would often describe her as reticent or shy. So I I was sort of left with this. I mean, she always wanted to be mysterious. <laughs> and yeah. she even said she wanted to be mysterious. And, and I felt by the end of the book that she was mysterious, that I, 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 I couldn't quite figure out who she was. And I think that was one of the images that she probably cherished about herself was that people didn't really know who she was. Yeah, and I, th- well, I I think she was different things at different times with different people. Um, I think the way she really opened up was during a sort of a geeky, you know, intellectual conversation. For example, she evinced this very early interest in Vietnam and the struggle for Vietnamese independence from France. And, you know, I took the author's prerogative and and, and certainly drawing an analogy there between um, the freedom that she experienced in Paris uh, from her parents' dictatorial ways to, you know, having a sense of empathy with the Vietnamese people. And of course, later on, that really comes to uh, uh, its fullness when, she sees Jack Kennedy in December of 51 after he's completed this tour and he's just come back from Vietnam himself, you know? And so um, I I think that was sometimes how she was known best was by her opinions on uh, substantive matters. I think, you know, she learned how to put it on. She learned how to walk and talk in a way that left an impression. So, and remember, as I point out in the book, she was very interested in being an actress. You know, she talked about uh, that possibly uh, instead of becoming a writer. Um, but the fact that she even had ambitions to be a- ambitions to be anything set her apart from her contemporaries. Well, and you know, she was debutante of the year, and then she met this guy who. Um, was had the perfect resume, you know, went to Yale and was a Wall Street banker and from a great family. And and she he started courting her and her mother was all in favor of it. And she was actually agreed to marry him, even though she wasn't in love with him, because she felt that she needed to get married 
And also because I think most people thought that she came from a family of wealth, but her father, Blackjack Bouvier, had basically squandered the family money. And um, so she was living at her parents' house uh, in Washington, her stepfather's house, Hugh D. Auchincloss, who he had a lot of money. So, and she was, as being debutante of the year, she was this glamorous figure and uh, cutting a, you're going to, cutting a great swath through, you know, the East Coast and going to all these parties. Um, and yet, and her mother, <laughs> so I thought was funny, was all for this guy until she found out he wasn't that rich. And then she sort of soured on him. But Jackie was still determined to marry this guy and sort of live this boring life, even though she knew it was not what she should want. That happens right at a moment when her boss at the Washington Times Herald, you know, one thing she didn't want people to know about was she started it at the paper as a clerk who couldn't even type. So she was answering the phones and, and uh, you know, delivering messages, and she was determined to be a writer. But um, it was not clear when she left for Christmas vacation at the end of 1951 whether that was really going to happen and in what form that would take. And he, this guy, John Husted, proposed to her, and I think it was a, mo a moment of panic of what am I going to do with my life? The other thing is that whole story about Janet not thinking he was wealthy enough is something he would tell people. And it may have been something Jackie su somehow suggested to him. But but she also made comments like she realized it was over when the most important thing to him was how to make the perfect uh, uh, martini, martini, you know. And <laughs> so so, you know. And she does meet Jack Kennedy at that point. Now, they're not dating. Their, their first date is actually um, uh, uh, to a, the dinner, what used to be a weekly dinner dance held at the Shoreham. And he brings his political advisor, Dave, Dave. Powers, along but to talk about strategy in his Senate campaign. Yeah. Now, it, but one thing was really clear all the way through is that she wanted to have a career. And she was determined to have a career. And she wanted to have a big career. I mean, she wanted to be a serious writer, a famous writer. And, um, and so she, but being a woman, it was hard to get a job. How did she get, manage to get the job um, of being this camera girl um, at the Washington Times Herald? I mean, that, that was a really unusual thing for a woman to be able to do at that time. Well, the paper itself had many uh, women writers, and the, the editor uh, who hired her, who I managed to interview, is quite elderly, but I interviewed him for As We Remember Her, and he also had done many, many interviews, basically the same stories, but slight differences uh, about this period when he hires her. Um, uh, uh, you know, it had been her stepfather who called his friend, um, who was the bureau chief of the New York Times, Arthur Kroc, who was friends, very good friends, with Frank Waldrop at the Washington Times Herald. And Waldrop had hired Kathleen Kennedy, uh, JFK's sister, as well as Inga Arbit, who was one of his girlfriends. Um, and so he had a history of hiring bright young women to see, you know, just how much talent they really had or didn't have. And then he would place them. And um, because she had such a wide ranging, uh, you know, degree of, of, of interest and didn't want to write just about, you know, high society or cover parties, um, he gave her the inquiring uh, photographer column, which nobody at the paper wanted because they considered it a really, you know, dull beat to, to, to just go out and stop strangers. And, you know, she turned it into what somebody called the best escapist literature in Washington, within three months, she gets a byline. Nobody had gotten a byline before that. And um, she continued to just, you know, she, she earned a couple of little headlines, national headlines from the column when she, for example, interviewed, she said an interview with little Trisha Nixon, the daughter of the then newly elected vice president. Um, so that made national headlines. And then she got into trouble by interviewing the two young nieces of, of President-elect Eisenhower. So, and, but, but as a result, the acquiring 
camera, uh, the inquiring photographer was renamed specifically for her, the inquiring camera girl. So she, well, she rated her own. I think that um, the thing that struck me the most was how um, how she interviewed every different kind of person from every different walk of life. I mean, six days a week, and, and they were man on the street type people, which one never associated with Jackie Kennedy once she was in the White House. And speaking of being in the White House, she meets Jack Kennedy. He asks her on a date. He brings his political associate. Um, they don't see each other on and off. But I'm fascinated by the, quote, courtship, because um, I, it seemed to me that, well, you put it this way, and she did, too, that he was not romantic, Jack Kennedy. And in yeah. fact, I think you said that there was never any, any in, instance where he said he loved her. Um, yeah. And it, you were a little fuzzy about whether she, what kind of a sexual past she had had <laughs> when she because was in I, Paris and all of Brown. Yeah. But with Jack Kennedy, the interesting thing was that I didn't get a sense of whether they actually had a sexual relationship. The only thing you mentioned was once they were making out in the back of a car. Right, right. Well, I think the truth is the record does not really document it. And one thing I wanted to do with this was, you know, what are oral histories? Oral histories it, it, it may be to some people nothing but a bunch of gossip or people's memories, you know. Um, and so it's all fallible. Um, the best documentation is what's written. But even then, you know, people write things. You know, Yusha, her stepbrother, said Jackie told him many stories and he wasn't always sure how true they were or not that necessarily that she made them up entirely, but that she created her, she made herself into a character. So um, when it comes to their sexual life, it was the early 1950s. Birth control was really not readily available for young women. She was a Catholic. Um, there are stories that she had been sexual in, in uh, Paris that, that had, was where she had her first experience. But as far as I feel comfortable because of what's documented and what's not documented, I, I just, I had to leave it fuzzy because I wasn't sure myself. And, well, you, you know. Yeah, it seems um, I, you, there was one fascinating conversation where his best friend, Lem Billings, pulls her aside at a party and says, basically, when, the, when he thought that Jack was getting ready to propose um, and said, you know, he has a lot of girlfriends and basically saying this is what it is and this is what it's always going to be and you need to understand that going into it and it it sounded to me like the relationship was pretty transactional for both of them i never got the sense that they were madly in love with each other i mean she um jack loved her uh, obviously loved her mind they were called kindred souls he loved her intelligence um and and she loved his mind I mean, they clearly had a lot in common intellectually, um, but she saw an opportunity with Jack Kennedy to have the kind of exciting life that she uh, really hoped to have and was all in on the, the, the campaign uh, for president and, and basically sort of pondered whether or not she could live a life like that. And I think with her father, you know, she saw, well, her father, Black Jack, Bouvier had had many affairs over the years, and and that's what men did. And if you want, you know, it was sort of a trade off. You had to make that decision of whether you wanted to go through with it, and she decided she did. But it it's, it it seemed to me that that sort of the relationship just kind of happened. It was sort of understood that she would be the perfect wife, and um, Joe Kennedy, his father, loved her, and she loved him, and everyone approved. And it was sort of decided that this was the right thing for him for his career and the right thing for her going forward with what she what kind of a life she wanted. Well, I, I would say I I believe very much that she loved him. I believe she maybe didn't love him realistically. Um, I think she loved him in a very romantic way, um, as if uh, she had in her mind uh, created uh, her very own prince, you know, forged from all the princes of history and fiction, 
that she had read about. She saw him as very heroic. Um, and um, I don't think that was a lie. Um, I, but I think as a person, she very quickly came to recognize his ego um, and his arrogance. Um, and uh, although that, you know, as uh, for a period following the, what comes after this book, which is their their first, you know, uh, few years of marriage, I think um, she was able to, you know, uh, put a, a hole in his ego sometimes. She could really call him out and she had no hesitation in doing that. So he did not intimidate her in that regard. I think he's really, you know, he's kind of like the ultimate Don Draper, you know, um, I think he, he, he f kind of fumbled with the idea of, of, of a man, a he-man showing affection, you know, uh, and, and he at one point told James McGregor Burns, one of his early biographers, I'm just not the heavy romantic type, you yeah. know, um, really? not, Neither was Eisenhower, neither, neither was Nixon, neither was LBJ, you know, or, you know, so or, or FDR. I, I don't think it was that uncommon with men of that era, particularly men whose great passion was power and politics. Although he seemed like a romantic character. But one of the things that fascinated me was uh, he was she had always been interested in Vietnam, particularly when she was in France and she spoke French and she was interested in the colonial aspect of that. And that Jack got onto that very early on and felt that the French should get out of Vietnam. And he asked her to write uh, a sort of a paper reading all of these French books about Vietnam, which she translated and then wrote a, an 86 page paper, which he used from then on with his speeches and his his um, discussions uh, and negotiations on Vietnam. And people would always compliment on him on how brilliant he was and how well versed he was in the subject. Yeah, and I'm, thank you so much for bringing that up. I mean, um, that to me is perhaps the single most important uh, aspect of the book. Um, <laughs> I may not, I'm not sure it interests everybody else, but for me, it really was, when I was up at the Kennedy Library and I was going through his Senate speech files, uh, the research that was used for his Senate speeches and, you know, looked up his um, uh, April 1954 and uh, June 1953 uh, speeches on the floor of the Senate about Vietnam. And I'm going through and there's, you know, uh, correspondence with the State Department and statistics and quotations. And then that inimitable, loopy handwriting of Jacqueline Bouvier, 88 pages. Part of it was type, part of its hand, most of it's handwritten. And it's, it, it's extraordinary. And it's more than a translation. It was also an interpretation. You know, at one point I pulled one of the quotes where she says, I dare you to say on the floor of the Senate, um, that uh, the, the Chinese communists um, uh, maybe should be allowed to help run Vietnam because they have the most integrity. So, you know, she was not just, uh, uh, you know, translating, she was really interpreting this. And I think it was an opinion, you know, they shared their view, but that speech right. was really the first speech that earned Jack Kennedy national attention on a internet on international affairs and that's when you begin to hear people saying this guy could be president someday carl um what's interesting to me is that she put all of this into her um in all of this energy into getting him elected and and basically ended up not having the career that she wanted to have and um at one point, my husband wrote about her saying that when they were doing a, when they were campaigning, that um, she was standing there, Jack rushed into the crowd and she stood there frozen um, and and not speak, not looking straight, just looking straight ahead and, and def defying anyone to speak to her so that she suddenly 
went from this expansive life to a really narrow life, if you want to call it that, in the White House, where she suddenly became a wife and mother and the sort of um, woman who was cheated on by her husband. Um, how do you think that that, how, how do you square that with who she really was? And by the way, we're almost out of time. So this is our last question. I, I, I think she was a wife and mother, but she was also an executive. The way she ran the White House and all of her projects with so much discipline and organization. Um, she continued, uh, certainly during his Senate years, to help him with speeches. She was able to pull up quotes uh, on the spot sometimes for him to in insert. The White House. In the White with, House. Yeah, but even during the Senate years, in the years immediately following, Originally, we were going to write uh, this book was going to take us into the fall of uh, the spring of uh, 1954. And so I had researched that. And there's and I talked to Arthur Schlesinger about it, but I also looked at his speeches and you see where she's, you know, helped him uh, with with uh, uh, material for speeches. He actually she actually did it for Bobby Kennedy later on, too. So, you know, she I think was able to have, you know, she was told she had to choose between A or B and she created C. Um, she was much- that's a, very, that's a very good way to put it. Yeah. Carl, um, unfortunately we're out of time um, and we'll have to leave it there. I can't wait to hear the, uh, I, I can't wait to read the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> and I suspect there is one coming on. Um, Carl Sferraza, Anthony, thank you so much for joining me here today and to talk about your new book, Camera Girl. Thank you so much, Sally. I really appreciate it. Really Thank good you. question. I appreciate that. Thank you. A reminder that Carl's book, Camera Girl, is available starting today. And thank you for joining us. Um, to learn more about our upcoming programs, please do go to WashingtonPostLive.com. I'm Sally Quinn. Thank you so much.